as I say, I'm an archaeological scientist. I won't make any apologies for that. It's basically where I came from. It's what I went into archaeology to do. I did a degree at Bradford in the 80s, which means that I have a founding a wide spectrum of scientific aspects for archaeology. I have a question for you. And it's just so that I can understand what sort of um, impact what I'm about to say has. So I'm interested to know amongst you, and also to check that you're all awake, um, how many of you class yourselves as decision makers in, in what we, in projects, that is someone who might design a project, who might have an influence on a project in terms of reviewing that design, or might have an influence in terms of talking to people in other parts of the profession in influencing the outcomes and the design of projects. If you could put your hands up if you class yourself as an influence. Okay, so we've probably got about 70 75 percent of the room that are influencers, which is very good. It helps us in this yeah. Right, so I'm going that wasn't a question. I'm going to start with a question, a set of questions. I'm going to outline the underlying philosophy behind the idea that I'm presenting to you. We're going to look at what science underlies that. There is an equation, I'm going to warn you, there's an equation, or well, there's three equations, don't worry. And I'm going to show you the results of some of the research that we've done in this area over the since about 2018. And then we'll look at how that addresses the question and we'll see if we can come up with a way forward. So, this is the question. If, what if, before we actually started digging a single picture on site, or even started scraping to clean site, we can actually tell you where the features are, the ones that you can't see. We all know there's this thing called weathering out. Let's say we didn't have to wait for weathering out. That could be invented. What if I can give you the relationships between your features before you actually start picking the relationships off that Mark so loves? What if I could tell you where to put your section to find the best environmental data and where the most finds are? Because you can pretend to. One question is why? Why do we dig a slot every ten meters? I mean, why? <laughs> what, where does that come from? It's not actually really a recognised sampling strategy. Sampling strategies tend to require some randomness to them. So again, why are we doing that? What if I could give you one section that would give you all the information from that bit? Wouldn't that be better? Maybe it's good. I can, well, I can tell you where, where the iron objects are in the beaches. Right, that saves a lot of metal detecting, and to be quite honest, metal detectors can't find some of these features at that depth. We can also, one, one thing that I found in working on sites is archaeologists have work with it's red, it's burned, but a lot of the time it isn't. I've taken samples, it's not burned. So, what if we could say, before you start, this is where burning is? What if I could show you where burning was and there's no evidence for it other than what I'm showing you? And what overall, if I can just provide some information that helps us unravel the site that literally you can't get from standard archaeological observation. So those are the challenges that I'm setting myself for the next 10 to 15 minutes. This is, a, this is basically a, a philosophy that Richard Feynman put forward for, it's to do with quantum physics, obviously he's a quantum physicist amongst other things. Um, he says, basically, to arrive at any new idea or change or theory, we need to guess what you need to guess first. You have to have some sort. So that's 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 your initial approach is some inkling as to what you're trying to achieve. We then you've got the theory and then we can test that theory. That's that's his idea. But as archaeologists we don't tend to do that. In science, the idea is that if you do the same experiment, it gives you the same result. In archaeology, we seem to expect doing something the same way to give us different results. And okay, on occasion you'll get odd finds that could change your understanding, but we're not really, that's just luck. That's not design. So 
I, what I'd say is I will just tend to do things backwards. And I will just explain why I've got quantum in the, in the title. So quantum in physics relates to understanding this, basically the behavior of the smallest things to give us information about the universe. In the show. And what I'm suggesting here is that we need to look at the information that we can get from the smallest particles on site, which are basically the soil particles, the minerals, and there are other talks coming up later in this session that will also underline that. I think Clive will cover some things on that, and also there's some um, geochemistry. So, what I'm saying is we need to look at what we can get from these smallest particles on the site. And I can remember this when I was, when I before I got into archaeology, being horrified at finding pottery on the spoil heaps of our children's excavations. I'm thinking, gosh, you're throwing pottery away, and I take it to them, and they look horrified at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, bear in mind, all that soil that we dig out of features is being chucked on the spoil heap, and that's inflation. Mm -hmm. Ah, the theory. Right. So, these three equations are absolutely critical to the philosophy here, but I pro you probably will want them translating. Um, so, what I do need you to remember from this is, look at the top one, and look at how complicated that looks. But bear in mind that that only covers two scenarios, and the scenario or two, two variables, and the scenarios we're looking at have multiple variables. So that equation is very, very simple. You compare this into the problems that we face, the bottom one, I just need you to remember in terms of the fact that that is a driving factor as to how I sort of came about this idea in the first place. But you don't need to know what they say because I can translate them for you. And this is what they mean. The first one means there are many different things that will contribute to what sort of response you get. So, for example, if we are looking at radiometry, which is what the bulk of what I'm going to talk about covers, and, but the method doesn't have to be just radiometry. The topsoil has quite a big influence on your result. When you do radiometry across the site, the topsoil is really, really influencing the outcome and the interpretation of what you do. The second thing, which the second formula was basically, it's a signal to what to noise ratio. So again, top, topsoil is creating a lot of noise. There's iron objects in it. It's, it's, it's very magnetic in itself. It's a lot more magnetic than subsoils in this country, and therefore the noise level is very high. So our, noise, our signal to noise ratio is poor for actually seeing what's through the topsoil. And the third equation is the strength of the signal drops very, very rapidly. It's one over our sheet that's a very, very fast decay in the strength of the signal. We call that attenuation. But so those are the three key premises, the scientific principles that underpin what we're going to look at now. So this is our first test of the method, and we call it post-strip geophysics. So what the idea is, we as archaeologists strip the whole site and we expose it down to the sub subsoil. So we've removed the topsoil, we've removed all that noise, and now what I'm going to get is just archaeology and responses from geology, probably, but um, mainly just archaeology. So the first thing that this slide is showing is, as archaeologists, we're fairly obsessed with what we can see. And this slide illustrates that what the archaeologists can see just after the site is stripped isn't actually where the archaeology is going. So this bit then goes up here. The archaeologists, with a dashed line, if they weren't sure, interpreted it as heading up there. Um, again, we're not seeing some of these features, we're not seeing this feature on the ground. Um, so there's information that archaeologists are starting with on the site that is both flawed and it's going to take time to unpick, or we're going to have to wait a couple of weeks for those features to weather out, which makes it difficult to plan what we're going to do, it makes it difficult to know what resource you need, because the last thing you want on, let's say, a four-week excavation is for everything to weather out and the fourth week and you find out you've got that. 10 times more features than you've started with and you're not going to finish on time. No. Or is that just our excuse for not planning? So, this is just to show an example of the difference between, this is the 
what the effect of the soil is. So I want you to think, look at this picture, we're going to do a spot the difference. <laughs> so you're looking at the texture of the data, so that's noise, the texture of the data. All the little black spots are all over it, first of all. Secondly, I want you to focus on this bit of the picture here. So obviously we can see we've got some enclosures, and this is courtesy of HS2, so fast way. And the problem we had with this site was, in that stage, obviously it's covered in topsoils and we can't see the archaeology, but when we stripped it, there was nothing there. Well, the archaeology said there was nothing there, there's obviously something there. But none of the features showed up after stripping it. So, we took the post-stripped geophysics radiology survey out on the site, and I will say the method is slightly different to a normal radiology survey, but I'm not, I don't have time to discuss the exact methodology at the moment. So the first thing you'll see is <laughs> some enclosures appearing here that you can see through the noise, or things appear through the noise. You'll also see that the texture of the data becomes much, much smoother, and that's not through filtering. Um, and we've got much clearer images of the way in which features are laid out. And literally, we have to take this plot, load the interpretation of it into the GIS, take it out onto the site, and actually spray the features out on the ground so that the archaeologists could dig them, because you couldn't see the features. And they dug them, and they began to get the edges of the features once they went down. But at the surface, they were not visible. I mean, I suppose we could have machined half the archaeology out, just which is the other way in which we tend to work. We carry on machining it before we get to the archaeology, but you're losing the upper strata, if you like, of the archaeology. We're losing femoral features in doing that. So this worked really well. I mean, none of we worked on it, but things like post and stuff began to weather out. But it meant that we weren't sat there for like three weeks or four weeks, because it took a long time for this, these features to weather out. Delaying the whole program with a whole team of archaeologists and tech not being able to do anything. So that's the first point. The second point I'd like to make is the number of times I hear people say, when they're doing trenching or whatever, they're putting trench across the geophysics anomaly and the geophysics was wrong. The geophysics can't be wrong. <laughs> the Earth's magnetic field is still there. This is just measuring the Earth's magnetic field. Something has to cause that response. Is it this scenario where actually? The archaeologists can't see the feature, and you need to just get the geophysics and test that bit of the trench. Because there are problems for that, but uh, we'll come to those in a minute. So, that's a really, really prime example on a major infrastructure project as to how this literally saved a phenomenal amount of program and allowed the archaeologists to carry on with their job. But it doesn't stop them. So this is, another, this is a site in Warwickshire. You can see how complicated it is. The archaeologists could see everything here. So we go from one, one sort of um, part of the spectrum to another where you can see nothing so that we can see far too much. And here, we're really struggling, and I don't know if you've come across it. Uh, there's anecdotal and actually, yeah, it's, I've seen it firsthand myself. Many occasions where archaeologists start digging the natural between features because there's so many features, they don't know which are features. So in this case, we did the survey, and that helps you understand which, where, which are the archaeological features and to trace them back. It doesn't necessarily find everything, and it's quite an interesting site, but it, it was a good example as to how we could come in and use the method to just assist the excavation team in doing their job. And bear in mind, it takes less than a day to do that survey. On all these sites, it takes less than a day collect this data. It's much, much more complicated to interpret it in terms of the post sort of feedback on site, but <coughs> it's not a slip, it's a fairly quick hit thing as long as you can get a geophysics team. So the other thing I said, what if we can tell the relationships between features? So the way in which features fill up, and we all know what a bar magnet is, so what happens is when a, when a ditch fills in, it behaves like a bar magnet, it's a whole bar magnet. So, I mean, in the same way that bar magnets have sort of mineral, uh, have mineral domains within them, the mineral domains in the ditch all align to the same magnetic field at the point that the ditch is still. Within. So here, you can see that there's a ditch that is actually continuously following one, one set of magnetic alignment that is cutting across 
this other bit that comes through it, you can see that basically the strength of that response and the continuity of it hasn't been interrupted. So if this stitch was later, that, that bar magnet would actually predominate. So literally, no, I don't really need to take a relationship slot there now, except for the fact that I'm going to have to convince people that method works, but... <laughs> And again, up here we can see either that will be a, a dead end. If that's not, if that ditch carries on through, then we know that it's cut by the ditch coming across if you like, or there's a small entrance there. So, um, in some cases, you can't see whether that's a relationship on this plot, and this is why you do need to do XY trace plots. If you look at the XY trace plots, you can actually see where um, things cross over. So the question about whether I can tell you where to find, where, where the most finds are. So here's a really nice example from that Warwickshire site. There's a pit. The little stars are fines. You can see it's packed with fines. And you can see here the enhancement in the response. So literally, if I'm looking at a ditch, I can see enhancements of responses along the ditches. Then if I put my sections where there's a response to enhance, that's where I'm looking to get the most material. So, it's not, all, it's not the sole rule, it's not going to find every single feature, but it works hand in glove with the archaeology. So this is a site in north of, in sort of Northumberland, so a different geology, a different challenge. It's actually a sort of uh, Iron Age, uh, the Imano British um, ironworking site. And it has some quite interesting characteristics, but you'll see from when I put the survey up that you can see a few roundhouses in here. When I put the survey up, you see we've got a lot. So there's a lot, the archaeologists are finding a lot more. But what's interesting about this site, just to give you a feel for the, so that's the distribution, the red stars are the distribution of um, iron slag on here, and the, the orange ones are pottery, and there's a little horseshoe in the middle. That just gives you an idea as to the, the, the spread of metalwork in the site. But when we zoom in and we look at one of the roundhouses, there's an interesting characteristic here. They're not made up of a single thing, they're made up of lots of isolated responses. So I asked the person who ran that site, what did you think those ditches were for? So they were much more, they could be they could be um they could be the outer wall but not load bearing. So the question would be, you know, you're looking at this, you can't see these as post holes in the bits, the fills are, are fairly homogenous, but what the geophysics is showing is Time and time again, in all these cases, we're getting these spots going round features. So this is something that you can use to begin to tie this, this, the way in which these have been constructed together, and it helps you to phase the site. And again, just to show the results of the XY, inside one of these, no feature, but I'm getting an enhanced response. So are these positions where hearts were, literally there's little evidence for hearts before, but and but time and time again, you look inside these and you've got these two, two, one or two enhanced patches which could be half locations, which the archaeologists can't see because the actual, the actual remains have obviously been truncated. So, I'd say that we should be wanting to, to know more, but what's stopping us using this type of method to, to do it? Um, I must say, having tried to wind this idea out for six years within heaven, it's been a challenge. <laughs> I would like to think that in the room you can see an advantage to using this method, this type of method on projects. It's still an evolving approach. Um, but I think targeting our approach to sites is, is, is a much better way of planning for what, for what we're going to, the information that we need to get out of the site. I think we could do this and then we can actually ask some better questions of the archaeology and really let's move away from our tendency to go out to test first, then theorise and then actually come up with the guess last. Let's sort of turn it around, let's be a little bit more quantum scientific about the way that we work. So that in a nutshell is the idea, we call it post-trip geophysics, you can, it doesn't have to be radiometry, we've done it with radar on urban sites, you can use um, electromagnetic methods for other things. Um, so, but I don't really want to leave it there, what I want to do is to sort of suggest to Sorry, England, to Fame, to Algeo, 
But we take this idea, if people, I mean, generally, if, people, if it's not a shit idea, then he's going to do that. Is. And, <laughs> and see if we can work together to bring this into mainstream. And I will say, it is a big change, because sort of to pay for it, if you decide to turn people on for a hundred days, it costs about as much as one of those days to just get the information for this. So could we give up one day's digging to allow us to better plan and get more high quality information from site? So that's my question.